text for our message this morning is from Matthew 16th chapter, and if you uh, have your bulletin in front of you or have a scripture in front of you, uh, if you'd like to turn to that at this time, we're going to be utilizing that, and at least for part of our sermon here. So uh, as we begin our sermon, I'd like you to go back a few years, many of you can go back this far, to 1973. The world was a different place, wasn't it? Now, many of you were not necessarily in this place right here, but maybe in different places around the world, or in the, at least around the country. 1973... It marked the completion of the tallest building in the world at that time. And this, although it is not in San Diego or in Sacramento or anywhere near us, but on the Chicago skyline, it is still known as one of the tallest buildings in the world. And that is what was formerly known as the Sears Tower. Many of you have heard of the Sears Tower. Some of you may have visited the Sears Tower. This building is quite the magnificent feature. See, this building is over 108 stories tall. It ha- it's over 1,500 feet tall. So if you need kind of an image, picture five football pl- fields lined up end to end to end to end to end to end. It's up standing straight up in the air. Wow. What a magnificent building. And even though it's no longer the tallest building, it's now the fifth tallest building, the Sears Tower, or now as it's known, the Willis Tower, is one of the tallest buildings. It is a masterpiece of planning, of engineering, of construction. Well, a couple of years ago, Grace Lutheran Church endeavored also to begin a building project. Now, admittedly, it was not quite to the scale of the Sears Tower, but you know that there was something in common you had with the builders of the Sears Tower. And that is, well, two things, actually. One, a firm foundation, and two, you had a plan. Now, at times, things don't go smoothly even with a plan, but you know that even as you are building any building you want to stand, you have to have a firm foundation, and you have to have a good plan. Even if you're building a tree house, or you're building the tallest building in the world. Even if you're remodeling the parish hall, or building a new church. You need to have a firm foundation, and you need to have a good plan. And think about it. It's not just in buildings that we need to have a good plan, is it? We like to have a good plan in life as well. We like to budget our money, have a good plan for where it's going to go. We like to have a good plan for our days, because oftentimes we notice if we don't have a plan for our days, they get away from us before we know. The hours turn, or the minutes turn into hours, and all of a sudden we realize, where did the day go? We like to have a good plan when we're getting dressed in the morning. Some of us, maybe not such a good plan, but matching shoes and a belt, or matching top and socks. Like I said, some of us, maybe we struggle with that more than others, and luckily we have a spouse who helps us out. But we like to have plans, even in food, we like to plan meals together, things like that. Now, I don't need to tell you, but I'm going to. But even in church, it's good to have a firm foundation and a good plan. And we know, because you are all here, that firm foundation needs to be in Christ. That firm foundation needs to be in our Lord, Jesus Christ. And our good plan we have right in front of us. That is in our scriptures. That is the plan that God has written for our life. That is what he, his instruction book, if you will. And you know this, and I know that you know this, because you are sitting here this morning. You know how important church is. You know how important scripture is. You know how important having a right relationship with God is. So it seems rather ridiculous for me to tell you, you need to be in church. You need to read your scriptures. Almost as ridiculous, I would say, as, as Jesus' question of the disciples today. If you would thumb back into uh, Matthew 16 there for a moment, notice this conversation as it goes down. We're a little later in Matthew. Now, Matthew has a few more chapters to go, 28 in all, but we're over halfway through. So let's look at where the disciples have been already, what they have seen already. Well, you don't have to go too far back to see that time and again, Jesus has already bested the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They have already witnessed several miracles of Christ. They've seen him walk on water, feed the 5,000. They've seen him raise the sick, or heal the sick, and even raise the dead at this point. So this seems like a ridiculous question, doesn't it? Who do people say that I am? You can almost picture it. Imagine if you were a fly on the wall right there. You can see the disciples. What? What? Why is he asking us that? Looking side to side, and well, some people say John the Baptist. And now this comes from a couple of, uh, actually comes from Herod. Herod believed that John the Baptist, after he had, cru- had killed him, cut off his head, that he had come back to life, and this was Jesus was actually John the Baptist. Some people say Elijah or or Jeremiah, and they thought that maybe because Elijah was taken up that now he's come back down. But Jesus gets to the point of the matter pretty quick, and he says, no, no, no. Who do you say I am? Who do you say that I am? 
You can imagine the looks for just a minute there, back and forth. Well, I hadn't really thought about that. They should know. They should be able to answer immediately. But they seem to, it seems like there's almost a question. And then Peter, with his typical brashness, his typical boldness, says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Like I said, this is an obvious answer. We know this. We have seen this time and again. They have no reason not to know. But we're not given this story. We're not given this account as a, re, as a way to show our superiority over the disciples, knowing that we, we know better than they did. We're not given this because of the fact that, well, that the, to show again just the lack of faith of the disciples. No, we're given this because it is so important what follows. In fact, what follows is something that has rocked the church time and again. It has caused church splits. It has caused denominational splits. It has caused problems throughout the years in the church. And if you don't have it open right now, I encourage you to look and see. But as Jesus responds to Peter, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. This has been subject to debate time and again. But isn't it true of most simple questions? They're very easy to ask, aren't they? But time and again, those simple questions are the ones that give us most pause when we answer. Well, in case you've already started to check out, in case you're planning on resting for the rest of the sermon, I want you to stop right now because this is the most important point. Christ is the foundation of the church. Christ is the foundation of our faith. Now, this seems like an obvious thing. This seems like it should be something that we know off the top of our heads. This seems like a very simple statement. However, look at the people of God. Look at the churches of God. Look at the preachers of God. Time and again, instead of sending the message that Christ is the foundation of faith, of the church, they send alternate messages. There are church bodies who believe that Peter is the foundation of the church. Well, no, that can't be. We can't be the foundation of the church. Because if we were the foundation, we are sinful people. We would be a foundation of sand. We would be a foundation that sinks so easily. And we see what happens when people put their faith in man. Let's look around. Look around you and think about who's not here with you this morning. Whether it's your your friends or relatives, your brothers and sisters, your, your sons and daughters or your grandkids. See, when we put our faith in ourselves, when we, when we look at that, that foundation, that firm foundation of Christ, and we say, no, I am the foundation, it starts to crack, it starts to shatter. And we see that there's repercussions not just in our, in our church either. There's repercussions not just in our preaching, not just in our faith lives, but there are repercussions in our family lives. We have seen how the, when Christ is not the firm foundation of a marriage, the firm foundation of a family. How quickly Satan tears that family apart. How quickly the selfishness of the, of the husband and the wife, how quickly the selfishness of the sons and daughters and the parents tear that relationship apart. When Christ is not the firm foundation, we turn from prayer to private time. Time where we self-actualize and we grow better individually. When Christ is not that firm foundation, when prayer is not a center point in, in marriages, we see how quickly, how quickly those marriages break down. But not just that. We see that this has ongoing repercussions. That this is not just in our churches, not just in our school, not just in our families, but it's in our schools, it's in our nation. We see how the foundation of Christ has been eroded from our nation. How the foundation of Christ in our schools has been erased. We see as we, look in, as we look forward to another year how Christ has been deleted out of just about everything. And look at what has happened. Because this is not just an epidemic in our nation, but it is a pandemic that has stretched across the world. It is something that has affected every nation, every tribe, every people. If you look around the world, you see how godless leaders have taken, taken, taken leadership roles. How evil has had its free run. We see how when Christ is not the foundation, which we think is so easy to say, we see how easy, how easy pushing him to the side seems to be. 
how easy it is to build on those things which bring us immediate joy and gratitude. How easy it is to, to, to celebrate ourselves, to celebrate these earthly things. See, we would think, even as members of the Christian church, that every church, that this would be so aware of in every Christian's life. That a firm foundation of, in Christ our Lord is so important. We would think that every, every church who, comes, who professes Christ as Savior would look to the Bible for guidance and direction, but this isn't the case. There are those. There are those who, who look at that foundation and say, I know better. Who look at those scriptures and say, I've, that's old, that's antiquated. We can put that aside for now. Maybe we'll, we'll get it out if we need it later. But that's not who Christ is. That's not what the church is. The church is firmly founded on Christ, her Savior. The church is the bride of Christ, who He loves with all His heart. The church, the church will, the church will rock and it will sway. It will undergo attacks from outside constantly. But the greatest attacks are those from within. When we do not have our firm foundation, our feet so, uh, solidly set on Christ. That is where we, where we start to see the destruction. We see the, that is where we see the destruction is from the inside. Those are the worst attacks. You know in your own families and your own marriages that, it, the, that it's not outside attacks that are the worst. But it's those inside attacks. You know that in our nation. It's not an outside enemy that's killing us. But it's an inside enemy that's destroying us. That's rotting us at the core. And there's only one. Only one foundation that cannot erode. There's only one foundation that cannot be destroyed, blasted away. And that is the foundation in Christ our Lord. Because our, sa- our Savior Jesus Christ, he didn't, do, he, didn't win our, he, didn't, he didn't go to Calvary and pay with gold or silver, but with his own precious blood to redeem us. He didn't walk out at the last minute and say it's an easier path this way. No, instead, he said, I will take the hard path. And so he did that so that he could declare, it is finished. It is finished. The victory of Satan, those are finished. The victory of death, that is finished. The victory of sin, that is finished. And you notice, what did he say? That when we have a firm foundation in him, that we will drive that sinful nature, that evil, back to the very gates of hell. That with the power of Christ, we need not be afraid. With the power of Christ, we, we need not fear. We need not hide out. But we have a power that is greater. We have the God who is holier. We have the God who is the one true God. Who has defeated sin, death, and the devil. Who has done so with his own body and blood for each one of us. That is our God. That is our sure foundation. And when we build on Christ, when we build on that sure foundation, we cannot fail. When we lift up our our hearts, when we lift up our faith in him, he will not disappoint us. No, it will not be easy. How hard is it? Have any of you ever had to dig up the foundation of a house? It is hard. But we have these foundations we have to destroy. We have to destroy these old ideologies that have taken over. And as a church, we need to lay that new foundation. That foundation that is in Christ alone. That foundation that cannot be shaken, that cannot be broken. We know that there will be those attacks. But when we are firmly founded on Him, when we have His Scripture as our guide, in our church, in our lives, and in our world. Satan better be afraid. Because we're coming. Satan better be afraid. Because he knows that he is defeated. He knows that he has no power. So what does this mean for you? Those of you who are sitting here this morning. Those of you who have planted your foundation in Christ. What does it mean? Does it mean that we should sit back? Of course not. Does it mean that we should be afraid? That would be the easy answer, wouldn't it? 
But no. We need to join together. Our fellow Christians, look side to side right now. Look around you. You're not alone in this church. Did you know that right now, even though even though Christianity isn't uh, celebrated in the news or as popular, but there are people meeting in churches all around the country right now. People who have said, our firm foundation is in Christ. The plan for my life is in His Word. We are not alone. We are not an island by ourselves here, but we are a people. We are a people who are founded in Christ. And as a people, not as a person, but as a people, a movement, we have the power to drive back hate, to reclaim our homes, our churches, our families, to reclaim our nation as one that is faithful, trusting in God. And we need to. <laughs> we need to do this. Because if we don't, who will? Who will? Who will tell people the truth? Who will show people the beauty that Christ has died for them. In and of ourselves, we certainly don't have the power. But in Christ, we do. In Christ, you do. In Christ, I do. We are able to make a difference. You are able to make a difference. Amen. Dear Lord, humble our hearts. Humble our minds and help us to to learn from your scriptures as though we were little children again, trusting you completely, giving over all that we that all the baggage that we carry. Help us when our foundation seems to rock and sway, when our when when our faith seems to struggle. Help us to make you that firm foundation, to hold steadfast to that promise. That promise that because you died on the cross, because you gave your life for us, that we will have life eternal with you. Lord, give us the hope. The hope that we are not alone. But that there is a nation. There is a world full of people who are your children, who have made you their firm foundation. Send us forth from this place, Lord. To show people your love. To show people that as your bride, you have not left us standing at the altar, but that you have you have taken us and that you hold us dearly. And that you will take all of your children into your precious arms and on the last day. Bring us home to you. In Jesus' holy and his precious name we pray. Amen.